We're talking about the geology of the Grand Canyon and the Rio Grande Rift, and with me is Dr. Laura Crossy and Dr. Carl Karlstrom, uh, both professors of, at the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of New Mexico. What is it about the Grand Canyon that makes it one of the world's iconic geologic landscapes and a destination for people from all over the world? I think it's the beautiful vistas which grab people. They go oh, to the edge of the canyon, they just gasp, you know, with the, with the beauty of it. But then something else sets in, which is it's beautiful and it's, it's natural. It has immense scale, huge distances, and it has immense time that sort of uh, creeps into your consciousness as you stand there on the rim. In a nutshell, what, what formed the Grand Canyon? And that's a hard thing for people to understand. I mean, the, that little river which looks so small down at the bottom yeah. carved the immense canyon. That's right. It started out uh, with the tools during floods. If you've ever stood by the side of a river in a flood and heard the boulders smash against each other when you have very high energy, the river uses the tools it finds. And essentially it's gravity, you know, the water is flowing downhill, in the case of the Colorado River, flowing from the Rockies out to the Gulf, and on its way it's carving through the landscape. We say it's a young canyon carved into very old rocks, and mm. the river has essentially carved most of the Grand Canyon in the last six million years, which is a very short amount of time for geologists, whereas the rocks that are revealed as the river is cut down through go back to about two billion. Explain to me what is the trail of time and how have you tried to articulate the immensity of geologic time to the public in this exhibit? I think that was the biggest challenge and the big idea of the exhibit was to give people a sense of geologic time first and foremost and then of course use the Grand Canyon geology to help illustrate that. So I tend to think of a million years as an as an example of uh, like what a heartbeat is to a human life. So a million years is like the heartbeat of Mother Earth. The trail uses a distance analogy for time, like any timeline. And it's on the rim, so you don't have to hike down. And you walk along the rim of the trail looking down, and each step is one million years of time. So then to walk back two billion years, you have to take 2,000 steps and so we have examples from every different rock formation brought up from the canyon from where they were in place and put on these uh, pedestals with, with, all they have is their age and their name. Wow. So are they evenly spaced along ah. the trail or how do you? <laughs> we, we only have one choice of where to place that rock on the timeline and that would be on its birthday. Oh. So each rock is at its place in the time scale Great. to the best of uh, what we would know from geological analysis of what the age of that rock layer is. And uh, actually, that, that's been the basis of a lot of our own research in the Grand Canyon area, has to do with establishing the geochronology of many of the different events and rocks in the canyon history. People wonder, okay, they're walking along and there's the rock that has the 540 million year trilobites, and then the next rock and the next rock, and then they'll walk a long ways and see no rocks. So these are periods of time on the timeline when, when there was erosion going on rather than deposition of layers. So the great unconformity is the biggest gap on the trail. You have to walk almost a thousand steps be between one rock and the next in terms of some parts of the canyon where a, a 540 million year old rock was deposited on a 1.7 billion year old rock. And so there's almost almost a thousand steps, a billion years missing in the rock record. So let me ask you this, in the geologic record along the trail, when did life first appear? That's a really, really good question because we tend to think of life as we see it. Geologists have a term for that, visible life. That's the Phanerozoic time period, visible life. Um, but we now know more about microscopic life. Mm. So if you try to think of where is the oldest evidence of microscopic life in rocks of Grand Canyon, what would you say to that? Well, life was on Earth before any of the rocks of Grand Canyon were formed. So 3.8 billion is, yeah, life, life. as far as we know, on planet Earth is the oldest evidence of microscopic life. Microscopic. Soon after the planet formed, life was present on Earth, um, 3.8 billion. But the first life really that's famous, that's visit, that's 
recorded in Grand Canyon are these little one single celled microfossils, they're called, that were found by uh, Charles Doolittle Walcott in 1896. So those go back 750 million, more or less. And then the first visible life, uh, when you see the trilobites and the fossils, that's about 540 million years. Wow. So that's the famous Cambrian explosion of life. Even exactly. in Grand Canyon, where it's thought to be one of the best and most spectacular records of geology, when there's a lot of <laughs> missing time. There's more time missing than captured in stone. Ah. So it's an imperfect recorder. So then based on that, is the great unconformity and the record of the evolution of life on Earth also present in New Mexico? To, to understand the entire history, we have to piece together what's been found in one area from another. The layer of limestone that you see when you go to the top of the Sandias, mm -hmm. that's present about halfway down as a layer in the Grand Canyon. Mm. And the oldest rocks in the bottom of the Grand Canyon are about the same age as the oldest rocks, 1.7, 1.8 billion, as the oldest rocks up by uh, in the Taos ski area, for instance. Explain to me, what is the Rio Grande Rift and how is that formed? Sure, you could think of it uh, as a tale of two rivers, the Colorado mm. River and the Rio Grande. There you go, I like two that. Different, uh, <laughs> two different rivers, uh, one with the, the Grand Canyon, and then we have the rift or the, the valley. So what's the difference between the valley versus the Grand Canyon? The Colorado River carved through the landscape to form the erosional feature of the Grand Canyon. But the Rio Grande flows through the Rio Grande Rift, which is a structural valley of immense proportion, far superior, I think, to Grand Canyon <laughs> really? as a geologic feature. And I am surprised that Dr. Carl Carlstrom, <laughs> structural geologist, thinks that Grand Canyon is more spectacular than our own Rio Grande Rift. Okay, I take your point, I take your point. <laughs> but, but the point is, one is an erosional feature, as you say, the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon, whereas the Rio Grande Rift Valley, which is an immense pull apart where the continent has been stretched, it's one of the two most famous continental rifts in the world, the East African Rift is the other one, and at about the same scale and is the Rio Grande Rift. Wow. It extends from El Paso to central Colorado. It's a big tear in the, in the North American plate. And it is immense, uh, but it's all filled with sand and gravel from the eroded sandia. So to the flying. casual observer, yeah. right. it doesn't look there like an go. amazing canyon. Right. Yeah. I like to think of the, uh, the, the view looking from Albuquerque up to the sandia mountains, and you look up at the crest and you see that, that beautiful white layer of limestone that Carl yeah. was talking about, the Madeira limestone. And if you envision that this has been dropped down structurally beneath the city of Albuquerque, if you were to put Mount Everest on the top of that same layer, the mountain wouldn't even stick out above the ground. Wow. So I that is a great far, way to describe that's it. That's far more spectacular, really, than Grand Canyon, but the problem is it's not, not visual. To, it's you have exactly. to see into the earth. Well, now you got me going. So the rift, <laughs> the rift is, is like uh, 30 miles wide and, and six miles deep, something like that. And the Grand Canyon is uh, 10 miles uh, wide and a mile deep. So as a, just a hole in the ground, if you took away all the sand and gravel from beneath Albuquerque, it's true. It's true, it's, okay. It's just many, kind of many scales bigger. use your mind's eye to see those scales. <laughs> what is common ground in terms of your research for both the Grand Canyon and the Rio Grande Rift? We tended to be doing a lot of work along fault structures. And along those faults are springs. And from the springs were waters that tended to be salty and they were just fizzing with CO2. So we started to think about the link of the fluids coming up along the fault. And trying to understand the patterns of that, linking those deep fluids uh, to see how they mix in and potentially degrade water quality. Uh, many people in New Mexico have been to a spectacular place like Soda Dam up near Hamas Springs. Uh, that's an example of a fluid coming up on a fault. It's a hot spring and it actually pours into the river. So even the surface waters in the southwest can be influenced by these deeper fluids. In the old days, people used to think the Rio Grande Rift was a giant sandbox and that the water filled the pores between sand grains all the way down this 10 kilometer deep sandbox. Well, now what we've learned is these faults partition the sandbox into sub-basins, the movement of fluids up the faults changes the water quality, mm -hmm. and only parts of the aquifer are really good uh, sources of groundwaters. 
But one of the terms that we haven't actually mentioned is the term of tectonics or plate tectonics. Plate tectonics. Where's the nearest plate boundary? Well, the base of the plate is only about 100 kilometers beneath us. And it has there's tremendously interesting things happening as uh, heat and mass gets transferred across Still. this boundary. Oh, yes, very active. And then we're sitting Always. on top of it, yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah. And in fact, that's, uh, that's, I think, a big finding of our uh, recent research is the hypothesis that in New Mexico, as well as Arizona, the mantle, the flowing, hot, convecting mantle, is uplifting the surface of the Earth. So we can link this idea mm -hmm. of tectonism to things that are very important to us sure. in our daily life. Every time we turn on the tap and get a glass of water in Albuquerque, it's either surface water or the deep groundwater, and both are influenced by tectonism, whether we realize it or not. So then, what do you think another 100 million years is going to, what's the Earth going to look like then? The Atlantic Ocean is pretty much less than 200 million years old. So if you ask what might a place look like, imagine mm -hmm. when North America was much closer to Europe, mm -hmm. and it's only taken a couple hundred million years to rift apart. And so in New Mexico, where we're next to the Rio Grande Rift, there's a question, is the rift really going to expand? Will we sometime, at some point separate the nation in a way that has never happened in history? Um, most people don't think so, but it's possible. It's a, ma it's a major rift. In 100 million years, we'd have, we could potentially have an ocean here that's half as wide as the Atlantic. It's important to study the geologic past because the future is so yeah. data poor. Each, each seems like each rock has its own story, you know. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Really appreciate it. Yes, you're quite welcome. <laughs>